Good evening, everybody. Um, <coughs> welcome. I'm going to run through the fire evacuation procedures. Uh, there are no fire alarms scheduled for this evening. Therefore, if the fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the building immediately. The fire exits are located at the rear and the side of this room. Go down the stairs and meet in the War Memorial Park. Please note this meeting is being webcast live on the internet. It's active now, and please can all members and, and the public switch your phones off or to silent, please. Right, I've got one announcement to make to the committee before we start going through the agenda. Uh, we found the viewing panel last week was a little bit pushed, and people, uh, we had a, a start time at 9 o'clock. Um, it's strongly suggested that we move that back to 9.15, and we will plan to leave the borough in the bus at 9.45. It was a question of, I think, traffic and what have you. Um, the internal arrangements of about the bus will remain the same, um, but that's been taken on board by Democratic Services. Uh, is everybody content with that? Yeah. Uh, the other thing is we'll be approaching uh, development control <coughs> to make sure we've got sufficient time between visits, because sometimes that can get a bit tight. But uh, that's flexible. We just need to revisit that and make sure we have sufficient time to transit between the, the various sites. Right. Do, do, do. Uh, just a reminder to all members and members of the public who will be speaking tonight, we have a new microphone system in this room, and uh, these microphones are very sensitive. If you are speaking, uh, be it at the table at the end or from the chairs around the committee table, anybody speaking next to you will be picked up on the microphone and will be broadcast on the Internet. We're also appearing in ultra high definition now the cameras have all been changed as well mm -hmm. so uh, and it's also indicative if you're sitting in the front chairs like our two visiting councillors are this evening uh, that could probably be picked up by that microphone as well but just to let you know for the benefit of the members of the public attending this evening I'd like to explain who everybody else if everyone is around this table my name is councillor Paul Miller and I'm the chairman of the committee down the sides of the table to the left and the right of me are councillors who sit on this committee and who will be making the decisions uh, on the applications this evening. Immediately to my left and right are the officers who will be advising councillors. In addition, I'd like to explain the Development Control Committee is a regulatory committee and not a political me meeting. The committee will be looking at the evidence brought before us tonight and will make a decision based on planning reasons. We are guided by national and local planning policy and guidance. I understand that planning can be very emotive and ask that everybody remains polite and professional throughout the evening. May I ask all speakers, including visiting members, to speak clearly and to return to their seats once their presentation is complete, following any questions from members. No further dialogue between members of the committee and speakers will be permitted once questioning has finished. May I ask all committee members to avoid repetition and ask members to keep any comments on each item to a maximum of four minutes. <coughs> right, uh, down through the agenda, apologies for absence and substitutions. I haven't been notified of any, so we're complete this evening. Are there any declarations of interest on any of the matters before us this evening? Any agenda items? There are no urgent matters. Minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of January 2017. Agreed. Agreed. Agreed? Thank you. I will sign those at the end of the meeting. Applications for planning permission. If I could ask the officers to introduce item number one. Thank you, Chair. This is an application to demolish the existing building, the erection of 11 two-bed houses and three one-bed flats. 
Members viewed the site and the viewing report is on the update paper. The officer's recommendation is for refusal. May I ask Kate Thompson and James Wallace to come forward, please? As I said, you have four minutes between you. Very sensitive mic. D try not to get too close to the microphone because it will induce feedback very quickly. Yeah. And it's just a, a single button there, a gray button for you to press. You have four minutes. Firstly, thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to speak at this planning committee. Um, I'm Kate Thompson from Affinity Sutton. Um, Affinity is a key stakeholder in the district and has been for well over 30 years and own and manage over 1,100 properties with a further 100 homes at various stages of development. We're a business for social purpose and invest any surpluses into maintaining our stock and building new homes. Sandringham Court was a former women's refuge and when Hampshire County Council withdrew re revenue funding, we had to reassess the use of the asset. We've worked with your property services team and their committee and they've agreed to change the restrictive covenant in the local authority's favour to limiting the site's use to affordable rented housing. We've secured grant funding from the HCA of £450,000 to provide 11 houses and three flats for rent just prior to the government switching the agenda to a more sales orientated programme. The scheme is just viable with the grant funding and investment from Affinity of £255,000 plus a loan raised to our private finance. With ever-increasing build costs and land being such a scarce resource, we have carefully assessed the most appropriate and viable option for the asset. We've looked at many designs for the site in conjunction with the planning and housing teams here in Basingstoke and also the local community, as we are keen to provide homes that people want to live in. We feel we've produced a well-thought-out scheme providing mostly houses with gardens for local families with nomination rights in favour of the local authority. I'll now pass on to my colleagues who will talk more about the design. Good evening. My name's James Wallace and I'm from Hunters Architects. I'm going to say a few words in relation to the scheme design. Um, the proposal, which is for 11 two-bed houses and three one-bed flats, are designed broadly in line with the footprint of the existing sheltered accommodation. With the exception of the corner three-storey feature, <coughs> The majority of the scheme is two storeys in height, similar in scale to the existing building. The scheme design has captured all of the Urban Design Office's comments, with the exception of two points. The officer has objected to the size of the rear gardens, which is below the 10 metre depth and 50 square metres as area, as recommended in your supplementary planning guidance. And we have 5.5 metre depth and 30 square metres. And now this is down to the shallow depth of the L-shaped site and as such it's difficult for us to overcome. However, the Paddock Road properties do enjoy private front gardens and more importantly have immediate access to, the to amenity opposite which is landscaped continuous into Russell Howard Park. Now given the, the excellent access to the local park, we feel that this on balance offers re reasonable mitigation. Finally, the officers objected to the lack of daylight to the corner plot number six. Now all of the units in the scheme are dual aspect. With an open plan ground floor, we believe this unit will enjoy good levels of daylight at and back. Thank you. Um, in summary, the scheme offers an excellent opportunity to create much needed affordable housing. And this is protected through the site's covenant. There is excellent access to high quality amenity in the immediate vicinity for residents to enjoy. And given the financial viability of modelling um, which was submitted to the council, it's clear the scheme would not be viable to develop as affordable housing if reduced in numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, now, I now open the floor to the members of the committee to ask you questions, and I'm going to kick that off. I have quite a simple question. Has any consideration been given to uh, bearing in mind that this site is being recommended for refusal by the officers uh, as to any other alternative uh, designs 
that may be policy com compliant? I think the problem is the, the um, restricted nature of the site and a policy compliance scheme would bring numbers down severely um, with gardens probably not being at the back. Do you want to interject? Ms. Yeah, I mean, it's the L-shaped footprint, so there really is only where one place to actually locate the building on the site, and that's literally in, in the same location as the existing building. Um, obviously, it's a change of use, and you know, the scheme originally wasn't subjected to your supplementary planning policy. Now, um, you know, reducing the number of units, we always spoke at the beginning about the viability of the scheme, um, and we just feel that um, yes, it's, it's affordable housing, and yes, the gardens aren't as deep. We can't increase the depth of the site. It's not within our ownership. But it is immediately in vicinity to local recreational grounds um, as, a, as a mitigation, and I understand that is a mitigation. I guess a scheme could be put on there of just all flats, but I think housing need at the moment. We're in such a situation, both within, in Basingstoke and nationally, where actually rented houses are difficult to provide and we've actually secured grant funding for this from the HCA, one of the last rented allocations under the, their particular program because everything switched to sale. Um, and I think it, it, it's, I'm quite passionate about it in, in just providing houses with gardens for local families. Thank you for that. Any other questions, members? to the applicants. Nope, thank you very much. Warden member, Councillor Reagan. Uh, will you be speaking separately, gentlemen? You have four minutes, Councillor. Is it on? Yep. Oh, great. Um, first of all, I explain that I know the history of this building. I lived in South Ham for over 50 years, and uh, I lived to the rear of Sandrum Court for the last 33 years. So I've seen it originally was an old people's home built in 63, and then in 1990 it was converted to, to the women's hostel. Uh, so I was more than happy after having a derelict building for two years empty in the back of me to be, to be planned for uh, affordable housing, which is so desperately needed. Anybody who's a, a ward councillor knows this. But it's with an heavy heart. I've, got, I've had a good think about this. I can't support the scheme. I say I can't support the scheme uh, for a couple of reasons. Two reasons. One was obviously the, what the officers were saying about the lack of amenity of small gardens. There's no... Uh, I agree with the planning policy. You can't expect affordable housing tenants to have lesser standards than other people. But another concern is there was an exhibition of this, these plans put up by Phoenix Sun in the local church, St Peter's Church, a couple of couple summers ago, I believe. And, uh, and the main concern, 95% of the people there was, uh, who went along, was parking. Now, if you look to the, if you think the history of the building, the building has never had match car, the tenants who lived in those buildings, they never had, obviously old people never had cars and very few of the, the, in the women's hostel had cars. So if you look to the access to the rear, it's an old service road built in, built in 1963, services the garages there and a few cars of visitors parking around the back. Well if you look at the, the back of the building, to, to the left, you've got the original parking places beyond Sovereign Land, but to the right there's a the, the parking for extra parking as well. So you, this, the assumption I think is uh, it's all a symbol of really a s symptom really sorry of the the old overdevelopment of the site. Um, and we've uh, and we've had I must say I mean we've had very little con as wall councillors we've had very little contact with the uh, Phoenix Island since the um, the exhibition a couple of years ago. But it's been very very uh, difficult to get hold of them at times, so there's been a lack of consultation. They might tell you differently, but it is. And uh, and I also, people first come to me about the condition of, of the derelict building. I mean, I was nearly forced to support uh, inferior application because of the, the, the way that the building's been left 
to deteriorate, but I think it's something they've done very little unless you kick up to secure the building. But overall, I reluctantly, with a very heavy art, support the officer's recommendation for a refusal. Thank you very much, Councillor Regan. Uh, any questions to the ward councillor? Thank you very much. Councillor Keating. Good evening, and you have four minutes. My name is Sean Keating. I am a ward councillor for South Ham and consequently has a great deal of interest in this particular building. It's been lying idle for the best part of two years, whilst people are actually in dire housing need in Basingstoke, certainly for the type of, type of houses that's been suggested and for the type of properties that we actually got. As, as a councillor, we were in we were involved to a small extent in the I issue of design and uh, we were successful in persuading the applicant to not put flat roofed um, flats in South Ham whereas there are no flat roofs in the normal course of events uh, with flats in Basingstoke in Basingstoke South Ham should I say. We were able to inform the applicant that the open space which is in front of the uh, paddock road uh, elevation uh, looks onto an open space which is currently the subject of a planning application which hasn't got here yet uh, but which consultation has taken place on of putting a nursery on that open space. They were not aware of that but we were. So we've got to the point where we uh, gave an undertaking to the applicant to help them to get the application to this committee. And we fulfilled that ob obligation that we undertook. We explained to the applicant that we were not in the process uh, of seeking to change council policy in relation to other forms of housing or size of gardens. It was not our role we saw to look for changes of rules for one applicant. So th the rules should apply to everybody and therefore uh, we are not seeking to alleviate uh, the problem of our gardens. We wanted this site developed. We do want this site developed and if anything that we can do can help that, that would be good. But we uh, are reluctant to see the officer's recommendation. We understand why, and we have not challenged that with them, and we were consulted by them. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keating. Members, any questions for the ward councillor? Councillor Luke. Can you put the um, other plan black, please, where it shows the back? That's, that's, that, that, that's a, well, that, yeah, that'll do. Uh, Councillor Keating, can you tell me, I see that the, on, on my, it's not the same as that, so there must be another one. It shows the garages. That's it. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, it shows the garages. Where's the sort of proposed parking for these new dwellings going to be? Because it doesn't look as if there's much room around the back. The answer to your question is, if you look at the s sketch in front of you, the L-shaped building is the building we're talking about. Across the road is St. Peter's Church. The uh, current uh, residents have got the entitlement to the strip of land behind uh, uh, the first block uh, to my right now, the strip of land, the current residents are entitled to use that garage area, which is owned by Sovereign Housing Association, and Sovereign Housing Association uh, have, have made and built in 
parking area, both in the garages, which you can do, uh, and off the, outside the garages to the rear of the one and two uh, current blocks. So the, the, par the parking and the, and the uh, garden will be behind the longer block. Am I making myself clear? If I had a red pen, I could point it, but I, but uh, especially with the with the chair on the way. <laughs> Any other questions? Nope. Thank. You. Councilor Cubitt. Um, would you not agree that if this site were in central London? In say somewhere very expensive like Chelsea or Kensington, never heard of it. Sure, I'll pull up. You would easily pay six million pounds for a house that size with a garden probably smaller than that with no parking. You could say that about most of basic stock. I mean, you could say that about the most of basic stock. And it wouldn't achieve anything other than to say bigger, bigger land prices in London than in Basic Law. It means nothing. But forgive my truthfulness. Any more questions? Thank you, Councillor Keating. Thank you. Members, questions to officers? Councillor Kibbit. Um. I have to say that um, whilst we have indicative sizes, this is such a wonderful opportunity for affordable homes to be built in our town and for our people. And whilst our guidelines on um, size of gardens is uh, high, you know, highly uh, commendable, and we all worked on it, uh, my point about Chelsea and Kensington, I think, is valid, that people give their right arm to live in a house with a garden that size um, in other parts of the country. And I think it would be better for us to have affordable homes there with gardens that are a little bit smaller than our normal <coughs> rules than to have no affordable homes being built on that site and for it to continue to be empty for another two, three years whilst this poor housing association is wasting and hemorrhaging cash trying to get a planning approval through and we need it. And the question to officers was? Um, on what basis could we approve this? On what, on what basis can we overrule the, um, the, uh, the minimum standards for the, the, um, the, 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 the garden? I mean, I would say that's down to you as members of the committee. You may agree, for example, with the applicant's argument that whilst accepting their substandard in terms of size because of their proximity to nearby open space, that's enough to offset um, any concerns that as, you know, as officers we're raising that as a quite a major reason for refusal. Um, I would say there are instances in terms of parking standards where we may not achieve the full amount. So if we're looking for a 10 metre rear garden, we may go for nine and a half and there may be reasons. But I would say these are substantially below what you would normally expect. It's not just half a metre or so. The other thing you need to remember as well is these are very small gardens. And in terms of meeting the requirement to provide cycle storage, which is another thing that they have to do, part of that garden area will be taken up by a garden shed as well. So you're reducing the size even further. Debate members? <coughs> Councillor Potter. Um, I understand, obviously, Councillor Cubitt's um, concern. We all have it, I think, really, in regard to the best intentions of all of those involved in this. But... Um, and I know that the design guidance is just that. It is guidance and, um, you know, clearly not absolutes. But in regard to what is being suggested here, I think it is so far below those standards that we ourselves have set within the local plan after <coughs> a great deal of consideration, skilled people beyond me 
talking about what would make acceptable spaces in the context of such a design, and I think this falls well short of that. Um, I mean, I have thoughts, as everybody else has around the room, how this conceivably um, could be changed to a design that might um, secure policy, com policy compliance. Um, and, but it's not for me to spell that out any more than anybody else from the committee, and I think we judge it on what we have before us. Um, and we've heard from the ward councillors, and I think that's endorsed also by the third ward councillor, that with um, heavy hearts, as they describe it, they resist the application. And um, I don't think we've got any alternative. This is so far away from a policy compliant application that I don't think this committee has any alternative but to follow the officer's recommendation. And um, uh, I support their recommendation. I, um, I would say this has to be refused, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Councillor Leakes? Well, I was going to propose the um, officer's recommendation. I will second Councillor Potter. And the word backyard comes to mind. Councillor Robinson? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we all accept the need for affordable housing, but a relatively short delay in getting this design of this right is worthwhile to inflict substandard housing on our residents for the next 50 years or so is unacceptable. I think we should ask the applicant to rethink the decision and provide something which respects the needs of our tenants. Thank you. And I support refusal of the application. Thank you. Councillor Cubitt. Yeah. Um, as, as I indicated, I, I can't su support the... Uh, uh, motion put forward by um, uh, Councillor Potter and, and seconded by um, Councillor Leake. Uh, I don't think that this proposal is substandard. Um, and and uh, as I alluded to, I mean, I lived in Camden, in a house in Camden Town for 15 years, right next door to a railway station with a garden smaller than that uh, and three other people living in the house. Uh, and we had a wonderful uh, life. So whilst our guidelines are there as indications, I don't think this proposal is substandard. And I think the need for 11... Um, affordable homes is so important to our borough that I think it would be very sad if it, if it, if it is refused and it, it slightly calls into question, in my opinion, many of the political uh, narratives that are put forward by uh, parties in our town when they can't approve this opportunity. Councillor Westbrook. Thank you, Chair. Just <coughs> briefly to Councillor... Uh, Councillor Cubitt's um, argument regarding Westminster and Chelsea. I would argue that many of the people that have those new, new huge large houses probably spent uh, quite a large amount of their time abroad in some Caribbean islands. So I wouldn't think for one minute that they they have those sort of, you know, they, they've got probably got choices, more choices than probably the residents that may end up living in Sandringham Court. Right, members, I have a motion before us to accept the officer's recommendation for refusal. It's been motion has been proposed and seconded. All those to support the officer's recommendation for refusal. And against that motion? Two. Thank you very much, officers. Thank you, Chair. The um, application is refused for the two reasons outlined on the um, committee report. Thank you. And move on to item number two. And could I ask, uh, sorry, I want to get this right. Could I ask Heather Rainbow to come up? the microphone, please. If the officers would present the application. Thank you, Chair. This is an outline application for up to 150 dwellings with only access for consideration at this stage. The site's an allocation in the adopted local plan as in, and is identified as Phase 1, with the east of Basingstoke area being Phase 2 of the allocation. The local plan allocation for the whole of the Redland site is for actually 165 dwellings. This site, as you can see, there's a corner at the bottom right-hand corner 
um, which is also part of the allocation. This falls outside of this application. Members viewed the site and noted the location of the proposed access on the, onto the A33 Gager Avenue roundabout. Um, the review, viewing report is on the update paper. We also have received one further letter of objection with the comments, with the comments raised that have been summarised as well and an officer comment in response. So the officer's um, recommendation for the application is for approval subject to the completion of a legal agreement. Thank you. Uh, Heather, you have four minutes. Um, <clears throat> I would like the approval to be delayed until the planned cycle route on A33 is designed and built as the desire line goes straight through this development. And as you can see from the layout plan, there is no cycle provision within the development. There is no room for a cycle uh, path or track to go on the highway on the other side of the hedge. Um, it is part of the strategic cycle network and the cycle strategy that all places should be connected. This is also in the local plan. And the desire line would be within that hedge line. Secondly, the site is not connected uh, outside places to the town centre, to the stations, secondary and tertiary education, to the employment areas, that's hospital, Danes Hill, Chunham Business Park, um, the uh, neighbouring settlements and controlled crossings of A33. And for this reason, I feel that the cycle routes should be indicated because then the gaps will be revealed and that it is not possible. Uh, lastly, in the travel plan, um, it states uh, pedestrian and cycle connections, uh, paragraph 5.4, um, that they only intend to provide cycling for trips less than five kilometres. That's a mere 15 minute journey. Um, it is, is supposed to be connected to the NCN 23, a prestigious, prestigious route. But to get that, the nearest connection to the NCN 23 takes you to Bramley, not to the town centre. So I would like this to be delayed until we have the line of the new cycle route along the A33 definitively outlined and until we have definite links from this um, development to the prime uh, destinations, all of which are within cycling time and distance, but the facilities are lacking. Thank you. Questions to the speaker? Councillor Westbrook. Good evening, Heather. Are you aware of the cycle route that, that runs through the east of Basingstoke? Do you know what that layout's going to be like in, in relation to this site? Uh, is the NCN 23, which there are two routes to this site. One goes along the A33, which has gaps and is not complete. And the other one uh, is the NCN, NCN 23, which comes from War Memorial Park in through East Rock Park and then out through Basing, Barton's uh, Lane and up Pyatt's Hill. Both of these routes would need to have a link along the A33. So you would be going from Pyatt's Hill along the internal boundary as close as possible to the hedge line. So that would take you up along the existing development uh, existing housing development, um, Lily Mill China, um, and along to the A33, and along the edge of the A33, and it would be within the hedge line of both east of Basingstoke and uh, the Redlands development. That link would also um, take you to the alternative uh, route, which would be along the A33, on the other side of the A33 coming out at um, Chinnam. Any more questions for the speaker? Thank you. Oh, 
Councillor Goodison. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> should the um, committee decide to approve this application, would, would you be content if the committee were to agree that a comment, not a condition, obviously because we can't put conditions on it, but a comment be made that the committee would uh, hope and expect to see adequate cycle provisions put in, in into the final plan? Would that, would that satisfy you? Um, I would be satisfied if there was an amendment for a site, because at the moment the site plan does not show sufficient space for a future cycle route. And I cannot see whether that su where else that su that um, cycle route will go. And it is actually we have we have commissioned consultants to do the feasibility study for this. There are plans to implement it. So it is absolutely essential we have the space there to do it. And before this planning application went in, there was potentially the space. So I would be in favour of having this passed subject to an amendment that the cycle um, space is put in on the edge of the uh, plan. So that's between the roundabout um, and this sort of the bottom left-hand corner of the, uh, of the map there. Uh, secondly, I would like to have indications showing the other um, routes to the main um, um, uh, des um, prime destinations, which should actually come in as a result of Easter Basingstoke development. So in other words, we need it to be linked into the SPD for these two sites. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Councillor Rowland, please. Good evening, Councillor, and you have four minutes. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, I'm representing my ward of Bramley and Sherfield on Loddon and also as chair of the Parish Council. And I'm here to speak on the application site, Land at Redlands, Reading Road, Sherfield on Loddon. This site has been consulted on with local residents and the developers have taken on board lessons learnt from Sherfield Park with regards to off-road parking and other areas of concern in the layout of the development. In principle, I would not have an issue with the Redlands site. However, we need to look at the bigger picture rather than this isolated one before us. There are three sites aligned, Redlands, 150 dwellings, Redlands Gardens for 17 dwellings, and the east of Basingstoke site, which today is looking at 450 dwellings and potentially up to 900. The objective two in the east of Basingstoke and Redlands development brief supplementary planning document consultation draft of January 2017 states, to deliver a sustainable development by making provision for public transport services and self, sorry, self safe, well-designed and convenient walking and cycling routes with the appropriate provision for car-based movement. The development would provide a safe and suitable access and would not cause an adverse impact on highway safety. Much has been made of the infrastructure being all important in the development of many dam. However, the same could be said of this site. Quoting again from the SP, PD, infrastructure and development should be delivered at the right time, in the right place, to ensure a high quality and sustainable community is established and that existing residents are not impacted by development. It was of some concern to me in the Hampshire County Council Highways update just a few months ago that they had not scheduled improvements to the A33 Gager Avenue until 2019 and seemed completely unaware of the Redland site and associated sites. The anticipated build for the Redland site as at the 1st of April 2016 clearly stated in during 2017 to 19 there will be 150 house, house completions. 
I have not seen anything in this application as to the timescales to address the concerns raised, raised by consulted parish councils of further increased traffic and the safe crossing of the A33 for pedestrians and cyclists to facilities within Chinham, Sherford Park and Sherfield on Rodden. Now we're actually experiencing an ever increasing accident rate, six on the A33 in as many weeks. Again, I would like to reiterate that I have no objection to the Redlands development. However, I believe that a more holistic approach should be taken to the overall development of infrastructure rather than the piecemeal approach we're seeing before us. I hope you're able to address this with the officers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the ward member? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Councillor Boyer, please. Good evening, Councillor. You have four minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Councillors, I'm the Ward Councillor for Chinham Ward, which includes the parish of Sherfield Park, which has over a thousand houses directly across the A33 from this site. <coughs> the Redlands outline application is focused on the principle of development and access. The A33 is the major trunk road between Reading and Basingstoke, and since Christmas has seen six major accidents. Hampshire County Council have plans to upgrade the Taylor's Farm roundabout, and I believe this application is premature and any building should not take place until the roadworks are completed. That said, the local plan and draft supplementary planning document has identified the principal and indicative main access to the site, but this aspect requi requires more detail especially the improvements to the Taylor's Farm roundabout and the protected access to the east of Basingstoke site as identified in the draft SPD currently out for consultation. It is understood that the draft SPD considers the routing of bus services through the Taylor's Farm roundabout to both Redlands and the east of Basingstoke sites and the spur road needed to accommodate these and other large service vehicles in the future. In addition, the access to each of Basingstoke must also satisfy these requirements. As part of the access within this application, pedestrian and cycle access to and from the Redland site must provide safe passage across the increasingly very busy A33 trunk route. The proposed light controlled crossing to the north of Taylor's Farm roundabout will cause delays on the roundabout at peak times and this may have to be accepted to ensure for the sake of a safe crossing. The draft SPD sets out a sensible master plan approach to the three proposed sites east of Basingstoke with a collaborative dialogue to take place between the respective developers. This approach must be followed to ensure all the necessary aspects of the development are addressed to achieve the best outcome for the future and existing communities in and around the sites. I approve this application, but I have some concerns that must be addressed. Thank you very much. Uh, members, any questions to the ward member? Thank you very much indeed, Joyce. Paul Watson and Andrew Blacker, please. Good evening again, gentlemen, and you have four minutes between you. Good evening, Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Thank you. Um, my name is Paul Watson from Phillips Planning Services, and I act on behalf of the applicant as the planning consultant. I have with me Mr. Andrew Blacker of WSP Highways, who has provided the highway and transportation advice in support of the proposal. I really just propose to hand over to Andrew to respond to some of the queries that have been raised by local members on highways. But before I do, I just wanted to highlight that one of the key points that was raised about the need for the A33 
gauge or avenue highway capacity um, enhancements as part of this scheme. The proposal actually does intend to deliver these and the draft legal agreement that would need to be signed if members were to support the application requires that those improvements are put in place before any of the properties on the site could be occupied. I'll just hand over to Andrew. Thanks, Paul. Um, I try to make a note of um, all the things that were being raised um, well, you know, in the last sort of 10 minutes or so. Um, so a few things that were uh, being said, the uh, cycle improvements um, is, is an outline planning application and the layout isn't fixed, uh, but we do intend to provide cycle routes through the development which will connect to the east of Basingstoke development to the south. Um, we are proposing to provide cycle route to the north and up to um, the Gager Avenue roundabout. And the crossing we propose is a toucan crossing, so that includes pedestrians and cyclists. Um, we do propose a cycle improvement um, on the A33, which will then connect into the Ga Gager Avenue um, with a drop curb dropping you back into um, the Taylor's Farm development. So we are providing everything we can um, on cycle improvements to NCN23 as well, which takes you through Taylor's Farm. So that's that's hopefully how we're doing dealing with that. Um, we are also providing a contribution, or we've offered to provide a contribution of £28,000 towards um, sustainable measures. Um, that is in addition to providing, as Paul said, the access to the development on the A33. The access to the development on the A33 will provide Hampshire County Council's improvement capacity scheme. Um, when we originally put the planning application in, we put the application in to serve the development, uh, which would meet the capacity requirements that we would need. Um, but in discussions with Hampshire, after the application was submitted, they then gave us the plans that they had for the capacity improvements. We took their scheme further forward and developed a scheme where we could then fit into their scheme. And so we will now provide the Hampshire Highway scheme, which will provide all the A33 improvements that they need for the committed developments, the planned developments up to 2029. Uh, that has, as we've been designing it, and obviously been a accepted by Hampshire County Council too. You've got one um, minute yeah, for any I'm kind of presentation I'm not, you've got. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if there was any other points. There was been concern, obviously, with the accidents. We did. We did do an accident r review over the last five years, but obviously the accidents uh, that have occurred in the last uh, month or so, um, we, we haven't observed them or, or been able to review them. We didn't find any issues with the highway network, as it were, um, before the last accidents have occurred, um, and we didn't and we don't expect uh, there would be any increase in accidents as a result of the 150 dwellings that we're proposing here. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know the details of them. I was involved in the queuing to one of the accidents, but I don't know what happened uh, in terms of why it happened. Okay, if you're done, if you just press your button, please. Thank you. Um, now, questions from committee members. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. How would you feel about providing a, an off-highway cycle route from the north of the south site to the south of the site running parallel to the A33? Um, I think that the, the master plan can accommodate it, but the one issue that we just need to note is that um, the, da the black dotted line um, on the plan was to indicate a uh, pedestrian and cycle route, uh, but there is a part of land uh, which is at the top um, as the curves, the road curves in, that the client doesn't have control over. So we can't provide the northern section. Um, we, we can't point here, can we? But um, there is a green, yes. So between, and so w w the red line coming in is the client in client's control, but you couldn't go directly south from there because it's not in the client's control. Councillor Potter. Thank you, Chair. Hello, Mr. Watson. Um, I just wanted to clarify, if I could, um, you've responded to most of the points, if not all of the points raised with you this evening in regard to uh, traffic and uh, highways. Um, were all those points covered within the, I think it was um, back in December 2016, the um, 
uh, revised travel plan that was submitted then. Did that actually contain some of the detail that you've been referring to tonight? Yes, the, the revised travel plan has, um, has been revised and it's been, um, it was revised in December and it's also been updated again this year as well um, to provide costings for the county as well in terms of contributions. Um, I've got a question for you. I happen to be a ward councillor adjacent to this as well. Um, it's back to the timing of the improvements to the Taylor's Farm roundabout. It leads into Gager Avenue, but it's, it's the Taylor's Farm roundabout. Uh, do I understand that you have now come to an agreement with Hampshire Highways that the improvements to that roundabout will be um, implemented before construction starts? Because in construction, I am given to understand, will come in through this loop road because that's the first thing you're going to have to build before you can start constructing houses. I was a little concerned to hear about, well, the improvements to the roundabout won't happen until it be, well, has to be completed before a house is sold. But it, it, timing is everything. Timing is probably one of the most crucial things on the minds of the local ward councillors and the local inhabitants <coughs> that the right infrastructure is put in at the right time because on the present information we have from a separate source in Hampshire Highways is that there was a two-year difference between the start of construction, which could be around 2017, from y yourselves, and the roadworks plan by on the A33 improvement plan was 2019. I understand now you're going to be bringing that forward and with agreement of uh, with mutual agreement between the Hampshire County Council. Am I correct in that understanding? Um, not quite. Um, so yes, the timing, we probably are going, if, if everything went to plan and, um, and we can get on site, but it, just in terms of the timings, it would be what's being proposed is it would be before occupation rather than um, con any construction work starts. Um, but we would still think that it would be sooner than 2019 uh, that the road would be improved um, because we don't think occupation would be sooner than that. First occupation. Just one more. Would you anticipate, following straight on from that, the anticipated that spur road going into the site would be the first thing that you do to get the construction traffic onto the site to build the houses? Yes, absolutely. Um, a, an, an access off the roundabout would need to be provided, but the access off it wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't have to put in the Toucan Crossing, uh, which is obviously there because the residents are there then. The capacity um, for the improvements um, isn't so much of a capacity, as I said earlier, that we need it for the development. It's a long-term capacity improvement for the A33 itself. Um, so access into the development for construction traffic to start building, and then one obviously once the houses have started, they will have to then phase that in to then getting the improvements for the A33 done as well. Understood. I've got one supplementary to all that. What is the capacity of that roundabout? Um, okay, in, in terms of we've done some testing, there isn't, we, we've not exploded the, 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 the roundabout in terms of to understand what its full capacity is, but we have done some tests to see um, if it could take some further scenarios in terms of increased traffic. Um, we have tested the junction to include east of Basingstoke, and we've included 900 dwellings east of Basingstoke and taken the junction up with all the committed development up to 2029 and the junction still works. So you've got 150 houses for Redlands, uh, 900 potentially east of Basingstoke. Assu we are assuming in that scenario that east of Basingstoke also has another southern point of access onto the A33, uh, but then we growth the traffic up to 2029 um, and it still works. Uh, could I just uh, add to that? I think, Chairman, that it's because the way the highway authority asks us to test it is to test that the development works. They don't ask us to then add another 500, another 500 to get to a point where we can say that's where it's a problem. So it more than meets the development's plan. Okay, I'll stop there. Councillor Cubitt. Um, one of the only reasons why the site's been unlocked, as it were, was uh, because we stated in our policy 
um, that there was joint master planning of the two sites. Um, development be delivered in conjunction with East of Basingstoke and Chinham, uh, SS 3.9, and that development be brought forward in a coordinated manner, and that this site should not be developed in isolation. And that is a fundamental uh, prerequisite to this policy. Could you talk us through a little bit how well your joint uh, master planning is going at the moment, what you're doing with Hampshire County Council and uh, what kind of relationship you've got with Hampshire County Council at the moment? Certainly, Councillor. Um, I, I don't know if it's possible to put the site plan back up on the screen, um, but Hampshire County Council are actually a landowner in the red line of our site. They own a triangle in the south um, west corner um, where the road link would actually go through from this site to the east of Bathingstoke si site to the south. And obviously being a landowner, they have uh, got together with our clients and there is a legal agreement in place between the County Council and ourselves for joint working on this site and to facilitate the link through and joint working on the um, Hampshire site to the south. So as part of that, all reports, all work that has been done the preparation of this application has been passed to Hampshire County Council and their officers um, have, have looked at it and been happy with everything that has been submitted before it's been submitted to, to Basingstoke and Dean Council. And that agreement carries on in terms of disposal of the land and um, bringing this site forward for development in the future, and that is a legal agreement. Um, are you happy, 100% uh, um, happy with our SPD? And what will your responses be to the consultation? We um, have had some early discussions with your urban designers before it was produced as part of the consultation, um, the, the less formal consultation before your current stage. And I think we've, we, we have no objections. We don't feel that it has any um, implications for what we propose in this application. Indeed, in anticipation of the brief being produced and broadly knowing what it was going to say about this site, we've tried to ensure that the application is in accordance with it, um, albeit not an adopted document at this stage. So we, we certainly won't be responding negatively. Any other questions, councillors? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Members, questions to officers? Debate? Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. I'm actually, we've had a lot of um, consultation with the applicant on this, and within the site itself, I'm, I'm largely sort of happy about it. Most of my concerns relate to its relationship with the A33, with the traffic, with the access, and with other people today, particularly the relationship of that with pedestrians and cyclists. And I do wonder whether we can do something regarding having an off-highway off cycle route, basically going from the north of the site to the south of the site. I appreciate the situation with the um, arc of land at the top, that that's not in their control. But I do wonder, can we insist on an off-road cycle route through a 106 agreement? We've done something conditioning land with a 106 agreement not too long ago. And if we could do that and say, yes, we would like to approve this site, but you will provide an off-highway off cycle route from basically the roundabout to the access to the land of East of Basingstoke site. If we could do that, I would basically be happy with the application. Right, two things. Um, Mike's going to help us out on response to your query there. I'd like to just add one more thing. Uh, it was discussed at a workshop last night, um, a few more details on this particular site, and what it was to do with the uh, supplementary planning document. And a fairly strong comment was made that if a cycle route is provided, it should have a separation between pedestrians and cyclists. Yeah. Uh, 
so there's no conflicts because you know I know around Chinnam itself we have a, a network of uh, small pathways more than adequate to host both um, cycles and pedestrians but the important thing for a cyclist is you've got to have a bell because that's the only way you can de-conflict yourself with some of the dog walkers and everything else. Everybody gets on, there's no problem. But um, to, uh, these demarcated cyclists one side, pedestrians the other, tend to work. And I'm just wondering, Mike, if you'd like comments on that, please. Thank you, councillors. Um, I think certainly in terms of the conditions set out already, there, there's, there's safeguards in there, but I think there's ways of strengthening those in terms of picking up the points that Councillor Robinson's um, uh, reference and, and the points you've just raised as well. Um, obviously, being an outline application of access to be considered the layout internally isn't known at this stage. That will be for reserve matters. But certainly in terms of condition five that's proposed, what we're suggesting is that there's a further master planning um, stage, if you like, between the outline application and the reserve matters. And one of those requirements is that the uh, movement network will have to be detailed, including the pedestrian and cycle connections. What I would then suggest is that there's work ongoing elsewhere in the council in terms of the cycle strategy and the options being taken forward there in terms of potential feasibility studies around links in terms of cycling. Um, so what I would suggest is that an additional informative is added so that the applicant is attention, if you like, is drawn to condition five in particular and the cycle and connection, cycleway connections. The committee's um, commentary, if you like, in terms of how that would be best approached internally in the site, but also suggesting consultation with other parts of the council in terms of how the cycling strategy is brought forward because I think all of those points tie in to the same outcome and objective. George. Councillor Cubitt. And just in addition to that, I mean, um, I made a reference to um, policy SS 3.7i, but there's also policy SS 3.7d, and that links very specifically to their obligations as a result of us unlocking this land to meet the cycle route requirements that we stipulated in the policy. So that it's there, but um, at the uh, meeting last night, um, Heather also made another reference, which is that in our cycle strategy, we have an aspiration, but that the Hampshire County Council doesn't have an obligation. But given that we've got a master planning opportunity here, uh, I would uh, ask that we try to meet the uh, national guideline, not the Hampshire County Council guideline, which I gather is is uh, a much poorer cousin um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, size of the cycle route. Thank you for that. Anyone else in debate? I'm going to take Councillor Robinson's suggestion that you're happy to move this as, uh, uh, for approval. I'm happy to move it for approval as long as there is some form of condition that says they will provide a cycle route. Not they'll think about it, not they might, or it will be considered, it's that they will. There is absolutely no wriggle room for them to get out of it. I think Mike did say he was suggesting that it would he would strengthen up the in certainly the informatives, but also the condition on that. Fine. Yes, accepted. It's written in the policies. I think, I think just to pick up on that point, Councillor Cuba is absolutely right and absolutely the reserve mass applications that come forward will have to respond both to the conditions, the informatives, if you like, is trying to direct the applicant towards that point and ultimately the council has control in terms of the final layout that would be approved through the reserve mass applications. So there's stages, if you like, of approval that are still required where decisions by the council will be made to make sure that that provision is, is, is provided. I have a second for the... Motion and it's uh, Councillor Goodison. All those in favour of approval of the application? Thank you, councillors. Officers? Thank you, Chair, that the application be approved subject to the strengthen strengthening of the wording in Condition 5 and also the additional informative referring to the off road cycle route. Um, separated from pedestrians and making reference to that it should meet the national guidelines and also that there should be consultation between the applicant um, um, council officers for in terms of bringing forward the council strategy. Thank you very much. Move on to item number three. And I understand 
that there will only be one speaker this evening. That will be Stephen Smallman. Good evening, Mr. Smallman. Um, you have four minutes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I beg your pardon. Can you hang on a second? My mistake. And would you like to present the application? This application is seeking consent for the rewording of some of the conditions which were attached to the Planning Commission for housing and replacement allotments on land off Caesars Way. Um, the, the rewording of the condition is sought to allow for the delivery of the replacement allotments ahead of the housing and access from Caesars Way. Um, if I can draw your attention to the updates sheet, you'll see that the Hire Officer has now made comments and has no objection to the proposal following the submission of additional details relating to the proposed use of an existing agricultural access along Bosford Way for the construction traffic in association with the delivery of the replacement allotments. The recommendation is therefore subject to the completion of a legal agreement to secure a deed of variation to the original legal agreement to secure the same obligations. Um, in addition, you'll see in the update report that there um, it proposes some additional highway conditions and some minor changes to the wording of some of the other conditions. And the recommendation is therefore for approval subject to the completion of the legal agreement. Mr. Smallman, you have now got four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as um, as Anna has just explained, um, the um, original planning permission, the 2015 planning permission, was for the erection of um, 34 dwellings and the provision of replacement allotments. Uh, this was a hybrid consent, an outline planning permission for the proposed housing and uh, a full planning permission for the change of use of the land to provide the replacement allotments. Um, the site is uh, currently owned by the Hospital of St. Cross, an ancient charity. The site for the new housing, the existing allotments, will in due course be sold to a house builder who will be responsible for obtaining approval to reserve matters and discharging the pre-commencement conditions pursuant to the outline consent that relates to the, uh, the housing. However, St. Cross will retain the site of the replacement allotments, which will then be let to the Blosswood Allotment Association. The terms of that lease and the detailed specification of the replacement allotments have been agreed with the uh, Allotment Association. St. Cross and the Allotment Association intend that the replacement allotments should be formed and brought into use at the earliest opportunity and in advance of the housing development to avoid any period when the allotments are not available or further disruption at the time when the existing allotment site is sold to the house builder uh, and built out. The proposal, therefore, is that the soil improvement works and the associated uh, fencing, landscaping, storage buildings and car parking uh, relating to the provision of the new allotments will be carried out as soon as possible and uh, hopefully um, during at the latest this spring. When complete, the existing allotment holders can then be relocated Following the grant of the lease to the uh, following the grant of the lease, and in the interim period, prior to the development of the new housing, um, a temporary access will be provided uh, via Blosswood Drive as an extension to the access that currently serves the existing allotments. And during the um, period that the new allotments are being formed, temporary access for construction traffic will be via the existing agricultural. Uh, access onto Blosswood, um, Blosswood Lane. However, as drafted, all of the pre-commencement conditions and all of the reserve matters attached to the hybrid permission would have to be discharged before any development, including the provision of the allotments, can be carried out. I think there are 28 uh, conditions attached to the outline consent, um, most of which relate solely to um, the provision of the housing. There's only one condition which relates directly to the replacement of the allotments, that's condition 17. And actually that condition has already been fully discharged. You have one minute. So the purpose of the application before you this evening is to disentangle 
the provision of the new allotments from the construction of the, of the housing scheme to enable the allotments to be provided at the earliest opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for the applicant? No. Oh, thank you, Mr. Swan. <coughs> May I uh, ask, is um, Mr. or Mrs. Phillips present? Because if they are, I understand they're not speaking this evening. I just want to make sure. Okay, it doesn't look as if they're here. Questions to officers, members? Questions? Any debate? I, in that case, um, I'm going to move for appro uh, approval. I believe is the uh, right expression, even though it's a change to conditions on this particular occasion. May I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Robinson. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you very much. Item number four. Yes, if we could just confirm that. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to completion of the legal agreement. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no speakers on the next application, um, which is the Street Overton. And would you introduce it, please? Um, this application is for the display of externally illuminated um, one illuminated fascia sign and one projecting sign um, at 10 Winchester Street, Overton. Thank you very much. I'd just like to comment that there is uh, an update that Overton Parish Council does not object to the revised application, and I understand the ward councillors um, have expressed the same wish. Um, any questions to officers? Uh, just chairman just picking up on what you just said on the update it mentions about the providing it was they do say that object to providing it's in keeping with the conservation area i'm guessing that the conservation officer hasn't got any problem, uh, any problem with it i'll let the officers answer that one yeah that's correct the you will see on page 119 of the report that the conservation officer has no objection any other questions any debate because i'm going to move it from the chair for approval all those in favour? Seconder. Uh, seconder. Thank you very much, Councillor Tucker. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. All those in favour? Thank you very much, Anne. The application is um, approved as per the um, committee report. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda number or the item number five. Uh, could I ask Mr. and Mrs. Wiles Mould to come forward, please? Please take a seat, and if you just wait there a minute, so the officers will introduce it. Uh, as I said, it's a very sensitive microphone. You don't need to get that close to it, um, but we'll take that in a minute. Sue? Thank you, Chair. This is an application for a single storey front and rear extensions, part conversion of the garage into living accommodation. Members viewed the site and the viewing report is on the update. The officer's recommendation is for approval. Thank you. And Mr. Mrs. Wildswold, you have four minutes between you. Uh, I understand, Mrs. Wildswold, you'll be speaking. You have four minutes. There's a grey button there. Off you go. Good evening. My husband and I are the owners of Seven Osprey Road, the neighbouring property most affected by this planning proposal. Our objections to this planning application concern both the change of use of the existing garage to living accommodation and the amended front garage extension. The garages of these properties were never designed to be living accommodation. Neither, and more importantly, they are not even attached to their own living accommodation. The bungalows were defined as link detached, not semi detached. A passageway from the front to the rear of each property typifies this. 
Official land registry plans support this, which I have made available to you. Blackwell's ordnance survey plans that were presented with number nine's planning application are not very clear and contain errors. However, if viewed from street level, each bungalow appears to be linked. This is because the flat roof actually spans both garage and passageway and connects each bungalow to its neighbour. This disguises the fact that each bungalow is not attached to its neighbour's living accommodation. The change of use from garage space to living accommodation will mean living accommodation will be directly attached to number seven's living accommodation, thus changing its title to semi-detached. This sets the very detrimental precedent to number seven and also potentially to our neighbour's properties in the future. This cannot be allowed. Surely no living accommodation should be permitted to be attached to any neighbouring living accommodation as a result of a change of use. If, however, the bungalows were linked detached garage to garage, as are numbers one and three, it would not be a problem to change the use of one of these garages to living accommodation. It would then be up to the neighbouring owner to choose whether to turn his or her property into a semi-detached property by putting living accommodation into their own garage. Unfortunately, we do not have this cho that choice in this instant with our type of linked detached properties here in Osprey Road. It's very unfair. Number seven will no longer be linked detached to number nine, but semi-detached actually by changing the use of the existing garage to living accommodation, together with the required removal of the internal access doors, now opens up the whole property and makes it completely semi-detached with number seven. My understanding of a semi-detached property is that the living accommodation mirrors that of its neighbour. How can this be the case with this application? The proposed accommodation for number nine contains a bedroom, toilet and shower room. This will be attached to the dining room and lounge of number seven. You this have has one to minute. be inappropriate. There is, where is the symmetry? We consider it an abuse of our property and rights. Twelve years ago, I purchased a link detached bungalow. If this planning application is approved, I will have to remarket it as a semi-detached bungalow through no desire, fault or choice of my own. Finally, we still have an issue regarding the front extension. Whatever space is planned, it cannot be attached to our flank wall as shown by the architect's plan. To do so will be a trespass. Our solicitor and property surveyor supports us in this matter. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, members, questions to the speakers? No. No questions? Thank you very much. Lawrence Nardi. Good evening. There's only one button to choose from, the little grey one. It's very sensitive, so just that's it. Super. You have four minutes. Good evening. My name is Lawrence Nardi. I'm agent for this application. Thank you for this opportunity to present our case. The current proposal set before you has been amended, subject to discussions with the planning case officer. The original application intended to provide a single-storey front extension to align with the front garage elevation of the adjoining property number seven. It also projected further to the rear. Following consultation, the front projection was removed and set back so as to be level with the existing front elevation of number nine. The rear projection was reduced by 1.2 metres and the internal doors amended. The resultant scheme is the one presented by the planning team for approval. Thank you for those members that attended the site visit. It is my understanding that both the front extension and garage conversion would likely be accepted as permitted development the planning officers could confirm this. The site visit illustrated how the application site is set some 200 millimetres or so below the adjoining rear boundary with number seven. Combined with the boundary fence, 
the projection of the flat roof extension above the fence is therefore minimal. The issue of parking and paths has been raised. This proposal provides two parking spaces to the frontage, exactly the same as the adjoining number seven. This will ensure that on-street parking is reduced and will not impact on the existing. An objection has been raised that this will provide a separate unit of accommodation. This is not proposed and anyway would have to be the subject of a separate planning application. Objections have been raised and an extension to this bungalow meant that people could not downsize, would set a precedent, obstruct the road during building works and reduce values. And as the committee members are aware, these are not material considerations for planning applications. It has also been stated that work has already started. This is definitely not the case, as the viewing committee noted. The planning officers have recommended the scheme for approval with no objections from their consultants, including highways. Indeed, the parking provision complies with minimum standards. The only reason this application is before this is committee is because of the number of objections. The two immediate neighbours and the two opposite have objected. This number of objections would not have been enough to present to committee. Three further objections have been received from properties at the head of the cul-de-sac. Indeed, one of those properties at the head of the cul-de-sac has a front garage extension, even though linked. In conclusion, the front extension and garage conversion are barely noticeable and very likely permitted development. The rear extension is set down and barely protrudes above the separating neighbour's fence. The officer's report clearly concludes that the extension would not result in any adverse impact on neighbours. The window and door provision do not provide overlooking issues. Parking standards are complied with. The proposal does not exacerbate the existing road provision and access. I thank the committee for the time to visit the site and listen to the presentation and respectfully request the committee consider the proposal favourably. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, questions? Councillor Goodison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nardi, would you not agree that a, having a bathroom next to a lounge stroke dining room is an adverse impact on somebody's living conditions? Would, might it have been possible to have put the bathroom further back at the rear of the extension? Well, as far as I'm aware, that extension to the front is, uh, uh, s sorry, uh, we, we have to comply with building regulations and building regulations will stipulate that the acoustic and heat insulation is adequate. So that's not a planning issue. So I, I don't believe that that sound will be transmitted because building regulations will cover that and ensure that doesn't happen. I've just completed one over at Litch Pit, two garages, and they precisely ask for that. And that's, that's all we can comply with. Councillor Mrs Court, I'm sorry uh, I didn't invite you in as the ward councillor, so you can ask, ask questions or... You'll forgive me. <laughs> um, I've got a few questions. Um, the, ice, the part at the beginning that's marked as garage is obviously far too small to be a garage as we'd understand it. What is the proposal for that space? That's my first question. on is it yeah. okay thank you the original proposal the garage was coming forward and that uh, I my plan in front of me has now got store on there so that will be used as a garage store I mean most of these garages of properties of this age uh, it's very difficult to use them as garages I'm sure you hopefully you would agree because many people can't get modern cars in and out of them so this is now going to be a store a storage area for garden implements and things such like all right, thank you. Um, your answer to the previous question about the noise. Unfortunately for you, I do live in a link detached property in Kempshot. Um, we are linked by garages to our neighbours. And over the years, on occasions, when a new resident has moved in, um, they complain about noise from the neighbouring garage. Actually, the way the slabs in those days were put side by side, although they might be separate, noise travels all the way up and down. So you can almost, I'd like to almost say you could hear a pin drop in the neighbouring garage. So what, surely you must be proposing to put some sort of insulation in to prevent that happening, because it doesn't happen at the moment. 
Yeah, I mean, the sound insulation has uh, increased significantly in the, in the past few years. I've just carried out one in Old Basing, and uh, the, the acoustic insulation required in there is, is substantially more than five or ten years ago. So building regulations will insist that there is a degree of sound insulation between these dwellings which complies with the building regulations, and that's all that can, I believe that sensibly can be expected. But it has improved maybe from when you're, the, the time you're looking at. So you're actually saying there's going to be something put up on the inside of that wall, sound insulation, but what about the noise travelling along slab, slab, from slab to slab? Well, there, there, will, there has to be um, uh, um, insulation in the floor as well because of, of heat loss, and that heat loss insulation also acts as an acoustic incident. If, if you look at my drawing there, you will see there is another wall, if, uh, if you've got the right scale plan, there is another wall inside of that wall, and that is the acoustic insulation. Thank you. Councillor Potter. It's, sorry, thank you, Chair. It's really only on the same point that Councillor Cord has raised there, but you would have heard what um, Mrs. Wiles Mole said about the um, legal advice they have that um, making any attachment to building adjacent to acoustic panel or whatever is determined here against the um, external cavity wall that they have is not permitted. They have legal advice that that can't be sustained. Now, do you have a comment on that? Well, my only comment is that I've carried out these on many occasions and um, I don't believe that is the case. So I have to disagree. I mean, it's an interesting point, isn't it, really, in law, I guess, really, in terms of ownership of that cavity wall, we can get officers' advice. Really. It may not be a planning matter when I think about the elements that make this um, issue live, but um, the intention there would be to put some form of additional skin, acoustic skin of some sort, which would increase the um, sound insulation from the proposed uh, changes that you're going to be making for number nine. That's the intention, I guess, isn't it? Am I live? Yes. The, the if you look at the plan there, there is a wall within the wall with a gap between it. This, is, this has been reduced to a smaller scale, uh, but that's exactly what that is. It's an, an independent wall built away from the other one. Uh, and I still reiterate that uh, it's my understanding that this is permitted development and therefore could be carried out without planning permission anyway. Uh, I'll go back to Council Court, first of all. Sorry, you just raised another question with your answer there. Um, as I've already said, I've lived in the property we live in, and I know that a lot, most of Kempshot was built at the same time. And I know that the agreement between our garage and the neighbouring wall, we are not allowed to put any fixings or fixtures onto that wall. Have you carried any of these out in Kempshot? And, I mean, how do you go about getting around that without fixing? Well, that wall is in, it can be independent. It's built away from the other wall. It's like a, it, it's like a cavity wall. So that's the stud work wall, which is built away from the other wall and sits separated from it. It's not attached to it. That's part of the reason for why the sound doesn't travel because it's not attached. Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you, Chair, but uh, Councillor Potter beat me to it. Councillor Bound. Uh, fo following on, um, the, the store, does that also have this sound insulation between it and the, the adjoining building? No. Any more questions, members? No? Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Court, uh, you do still have an opportunity as ward member to speak, if you so wish. <coughs> it's obviously quite apparent I don't like this, and from the advice I've uh, received, there's not, they, I, nobody's been able to find any planning, material planning reasons to reject it. However, over the years, I mean, if people who came on the viewing saw across the road we had two-storey properties, similar properties to that across the area have applied to build out over the garage and have been refused over the years because 
it would create a terraced effect. Well, here we have bungalows. We have a great shortage of bungalows within the borough, and we are making it into a terrace and increasing the size of it. Well, I'd ask members just to consider if this applicant had actually asked to put another story onto the bungalow, would we be looking for approving that? It's the same sort of thing in my view. Sorry, I didn't... Oh. So, I'm not quite sure. We have a lot of bungalows that, have, that are link detached. There's one on... The Dave, or several on the Davis estates, and all of them have been very neighbourly and considerate, have had, had extensions built, and they've gone out the back or built on the back of the garage and gone round the bungalows. And all of them have preserved that space between each property. So th I can understand where the neighbour here is coming from when she feels she's going to be living in a semi-detached house. I haven't been comforted by the fact, because I do know from having spent years in our property, the noise travels from slab to slab because they are built up against each other. There's not a lot between them, and the noise travels underneath. So I don't know, without digging up the slab, how you're going to put additional insulation between the slabs to stop that. Oh, somebody tapping me on the back. Um, I'd be very interested to hear what other committee members have to say, and maybe I can come back at the end. Thank you very much. Any questions to the ward member? Because they're going to move on to questions to officers. Councillor Bound. Um, I, I'm presuming that there will be nothing to prevent the um, the, uh, uh, the the applicant, the, the house owner, eventually turning that store into accommodation without any acoustic effect between the two buildings. Am I right? I mean, that's something for the councillors to decide tonight. There's no um, recommended condition at the moment that it should be kept as a store. Um, I would also add that with regards to the existing garage, um, no planning permission is required to change it into a living accommodation as it stands at the moment, so the agent's right in that regard. The store area as well equally doesn't need permission because it doesn't come forward of the front elevation of the house. Um, if you were concerned how the store was to be used at a later date, you could always condition that it should only be used as a store. But bearing in mind that the parking provision is being adequately provided for elsewhere on the site, we wouldn't normally put a condition on to say that something then has to be kept as a store. That would be potentially considered unreasonable and unnecessary. And it wasn't the use of the store. It was the fact that it didn't have the acoustic um, element that the other part of the build would have. But that would be no different to the existing garages that are present in that road at the moment. Councillor Westbrook. Thank you, Chairman. Just a, just a quick question, really more clarification. On page 131, the site plan, it shows you the row of bungalows. Am I right in thinking that bungalow 11 is already joined to 9, whereas obviously the others all look like they're detached, but... That's already taken place between 11 and 9, is that correct? That photo there actually shows the front door. Um, and basically, what, whilst I think they've, they've equally done the same as number 9, but I think they all look like that. They, basically, the front door is in that location of that al the, the passageway that, work, that is between the garage and the, um, the actual bungalow. Flat roof going over. The photo in front of you with the white door is number 11, and the application site is to the left. Councillor Cubitt. Um, yes, it, um, to the officers, um, can we um, put in a, a condition um, that the uh, acoustics and the noise uh, problem that can manifest itself uh, can be prevented? I, can we ask for extra... Um, requirements vis-a-vis -vis building regs uh, to take into account the design that uh, our very knowledgeable wall council has already made reference to vis-a-vis -vis the floors, the ceilings and the wall. Um, I, I would say there's a couple of points. Firstly, it could be converted without any planning permission. So you wouldn't, potentially the applicant could um, 
have withdrawn this application, converted the garage, and you'd have no control over it. The only control was be, would be through the building regs application. Um, it would therefore be unreasonable um, to put any condition over and above what would be reasonably re be required through the building regs approval on something that technically doesn't need planning permission anyway. But but I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying, but if one was to take a more pragmatic approach, they are having to put in the planning application because they have put in an extension at the back, um, which wouldn't fall uh, within permitted development rights, would it, the extension at the back? The, the extension at the back would need planning permission, yes, but they could, for example, they could withdraw this application, resubmit it with just the rear extension. But the, the end result could it be exactly the same as before you tonight because they could do the other works without needing planning permission. Okay. I'm going to move on. No other questions to officers? Debate? Councillor Potter. I think we've just got to take... Um, you know, set a fairly pragmatic view on this, really. The simple fact is the majority, I think it is, in terms of the um, proposed alterations, um, and certainly the most significant ones, are could be done under permitted development. Um, when it comes to noise, um, I guess it's a matter of debate, really, whether the noise generated from some form of living accommodation would be higher than that you get generated from a garage anyway you know an uninsulated garage with all sorts of activity tools the sort of thing that we all experience from a garage that can probably be worse i would have thought than people living next to each other in living accommodation really so i think you know we've got to put this into context really um i think it it clearly is this is the case that um if ever there was um a contradiction in terms it's the um, link detached description um, I never understood it really and it was really I think developers who thought that it sounded rather good in comparison to the truth of the matter that they are linked houses by any definition semi-detached in some form or other um, either it's detached or it's linked and you know I'm confused by the way people put so much store on it um, I guess it has a value um, limited value really in the context of housing prices but in terms of this it is something which has, has been we've been reminded of by officers falls under the heading of permitted development certainly the more contentious areas and therefore I think we have to recognize this um, I, I guess what Mr. Nali is saying in regard to the acoustic improvements um, they can work even with a couple of inch gap between the new skin that's put in and the existing party wall and I think that has to be mind you that's going to be overseen by building control comes outside of our remit really I think in this regard um, and on that basis I follow the officer's advice and uh, I think this should be approved and uh, I, I propose that chair thank you very much and uh, Councillor Robinson thank you chair I think changing a neighbour's property from link detached to semi-detached is unacceptable and I think in this case it's possibly illegal. The neighbour's property is a boundary wall not a party wall and so taking it from that I'm looking at EM10 and 1C does it positively contribute to the appearance of of the use of streets and other public space, it certainly doesn't positively contribute to the appearance. Um, two, development proposed should re be required to respect the local environment and amenities of neighbour's properties. Well, it doesn't respect the neighbour's property at all. Two A, positively co contribute to local distinctiveness. Well, it doesn't do that. And two B, um, two, three. I carry on. Um, have due regard for scale for the density layout and appearance and architectural detailing. It doesn't do that, so I believe it should be refused. Thank you. Councillor Bound. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I, I would have to agree with Councillor Potter on this. I think 
um, bearing in mind what can be done under permitted development and the fact that it could be withdrawn and they could put an application just for the rear and do what they like, the front under permitted development. I don't see that we've got reason to refuse it and I would second the, um, if it was first it. <laughs> it, was. it was proposed, yes. Any other comment and debate? It's been proposed and seconded that the application is approved. All those in favour? All those against? Five four, five against. Chairman casting vote. I will go with the officer's uh, recommendation. It's approved. Thank you, Chair, that the application be approved subject to conditions on the um, officer's report. Thank you, everybody. Meeting is concluded at 8.10 p.m. And thank you very much. Thank you, officers, and thank you, members.